Stefan, thank you. René, uh, first I would like to thank for the opportunity to give this lecture on percutaneous pulmonary valve implantation, infective endocarditis incidents and implications. Thanks for inviting me. I'm a proctor for the malady valve. So if an uh, infective endocarditis comes to practice, the pathogens have to gain access to the bloodstream. Also, it has to be that there is a defect in the uh, endothelium. Uh, the next, some pathogen species gain entry to cells causing inflammation of tissue, and pathogens uh, proliferate, leading to maturation, leading to maturation um, and vegetations to form. And these vegetations may embolize and cause a general infection. So no matter what valve is implanted, if it's a, a biological one or another prosthesis, by surgical means or transcatheter means, every, uh, bio, uh, every prosthesis has a risk for uh, endo infective endocarditis. And uh, it was uh, the David Durack who created the Duke criteria in the year 1994, which were modified by Lee in the year 2000. And if two major, one major and three minor, or five, major, uh, five minor criteria are present, we talk about infectious endocarditis. But this was done for, developed for native valve endocarditis, and the applicability to prosthetic valve endocarditis is very questionable. The new valvular stenosis is not listed in the Duke criteria, but indicative of infective endocarditis in prosthetic valves. So there is a potential limitation of diagnostic modalities. It may be very difficult to visualize the right ventricular outflow tract with all the metal in place using echocardiography, and it is very imp sometimes impossible to see the valve. It also may be difficult to distinguish between valve-related and not valve-related infective endocarditis. Blood cultures and TEE are often more negative for endocarditis in prosthetic valves than in native valves. And echo imaging is negative in as many as 70% in patients with congenital heart disease. So uh, we also in Munich, uh, we, use, we use for the definite diagnosis of endocarditis what uh, Lars Söndergaard and his group in Copenhagen uh, suggested. If we can't visualize the valve, we use intracardiac echo to be really sure that the valve is not affected. The ESC guidelines or the ESC task force proposed that the sensitivity of the Duke criteria can be improved by new imaging modalities, MRI, CT, PET scan or SPECT that allow diagnosis of embolic events and cardiac involvement when echocardiographic findings are negative or doubtful. So the ESC task force created three more uh, additional points to the Duke criteria. The identification of paravalvular lesions by cardiac CT should be considered a major criterion, especially if it's the aortic valve. In the setting of su the suspicion of endocarditis on a prosthetic valve, abnormal activity around the site of implantation detected by PET scan or by SCAT, uh, SPECT, if it's more than three months after the operation, should be considered a major criterion. And the identification of recent embolic events or infectious aneurysms by imaging only as a silent events should be considered a minor criterion. So there is a need for standardized definitions and reporting criteria. The rates as published may be over or underestimated. And infective endocarditis, the incidence may be reported as a cumulative incidence, which of course is extremely time related because it depends how long you see the patients or it's, uh, uh, the incidence is reported as infective endocarditis incident per patient year, which should be the one, this is more easy to compare it. But the comparison of IE rates across publications is very difficult, as IE is not always equally defined. So let's have a look at prosthetic aortic valve endocarditis. It occurs at 3 to 4% of patients within five years of the index surgery and affects mechanical and bioprosthetic valves equally. And this is a big uh, publication in The Lancet from the last year. 
more than one third of the cases are healthcare acquired, and if early prostatic IE occurs, it's usually caused by staphylococci. Later on, it's the same organisms that are seen in native valve and infective endocarditis. If Staph aureus affects a prosthetic valve in aortic position, mortality may be up to 50%, so it's really bad. Now, what's the incidence of infective endocarditis after TAVI, or uh, transaortic valve uh, replacement? There's three papers I cited here. First one is a US registry coming to 1.5% uh, uh, incidence per patient year. Second one is from Copenhagen, only the TAVI with a core valve, they came for, to 2.1% per patient year. And finally, the largest cohort is, a, uh, is a, uh, 47, uh, 47 centers in Europe, the US and South America. They had an incidence of 1.1% per patient year. But all of these three studies, as Peter said before, have a follow-up of one year. They don't have a longer follow-up. And our patients don't live years, but they live decades. So we have to think about longer terms. So now, if we look at our patients whom we treated in Munich, we have now treated 258 patients with right-sided valve implantation at a median age of 19 years. You see the diagnosis. Mostly, we implanted our valves in pulmonic positions, 237 some tricuspid positions. Most, we, we used the melody valve, but we also used 10% sapien valves of different sizes, as you see. So, uh, Peter already told you that we, since, the, since we started our program in December 2006 with a percutaneous valve implantation, we've looked at the same time at our surgical cases that you see it's the same, more or less the same number, it's the blue bars, and you see that lately, or in the later years, we've been doing more interventional cases than surgical cases. 2017 is not ready yet. And of course, we only do lately the cases uh, surgically that can't be treated in the cath lab. So usually patients with a wide right ventricular outflow tract or with abnormal coronary anatomy. So we are comparing a little bit peers with apples because they are not the same patients as patients with percutaneous valve usually have a tight or a stenotic outflow tract, whereas patients for surgery have pulmonary regurgitation. What I may say at this point is that in Munich, we are lucky to have a really good infrastructure. We have three study nurses and we have Alfred Hager, who is really meticulous to look after every patient. So I can really say our follow-up is nearly complete. Uh, patients have the same age as you see here in this slide. And if you see, you've seen that uh, picture before by Peter, but there were two dips uh, before, which uh, in this picture are not present anymore because I have a more recent follow-up. And you see these two curves at 10 years are absolutely identical. So the surgical cohort and the interventional cohort have the same result after 10 years. And we've heard from Philip today that it was an intervention that was planned for two years. And now, of course, in the Kaplan Meyer, there's some weakness because here there's only one uh, patient for, uh, for the interventional one after 10 years. So, uh, and he received a valve in valve procedure. So, if you look at the whole, 91% of our interventional group of patients still live with a valve that we implanted. Now, I'm not, uh, I should not talk about our successes, I should talk about endocarditis, which, of course, grieves my heart as an interventionist. I don't really want to talk about this subject, but I have to. So we have 15 cases, uh, 15 patients who had an infective endocarditis in our percutaneous group and 17 episodes, which comes to a cumulative incidence of endocarditis of 6%. Nine patients were managed medically. In eight patients, the uh, pulmonic valve had to be exchanged surgically. We have now 922 patient years follow-up, which is one of the highest, uh, I think maybe the highest uh, number of patient follow-up for uh, interventional cases in the pulmonic position. And our annual incidence of en effective endocarditis is 1.9% per patient year. So what do we do if we suspect infectious endocarditis in a patient? Well, first, we have to assess if the patient is severely sick 
if the patient is severely sick, we have to do something instantly because the Paris group in uh, uh, Necker have shown they lost three patients within the first 24 hours uh, just because they died. So you have to be very sure that the patient is hemodynamically stable, that you can wait. So if you can wait, uh, we start to collect blood cultures, six in 48 hours, and then we decide further on if we can go on with a medical treatment or if we have to go for surgery. If we treat medically, we use it for six weeks, the antibiotics, and if we can't really see the valve, we do ice, sometimes we do a PET scan, CT we do to look for pulmonary embolizations. After six weeks of antibiotics, we take them off, and then we take blood cultures again and decide if we think the patient is cured. So just to give you an example, this is a nine-year-old girl, 27 kilos, she came from Romania, she had a tuck with a Contegra uh, conduit and received a malady valve last year in June. After six main months, she came back in septic shock with multiple abscesses in her lung, and she was really, really sick. So we didn't really wait, put her on antibiotics and did surgery right away, and she's now alive and well. And we didn't use any ice because you can see here the undulating thrombus in the normal transthoracic echo. So with a very sick patient, with the abscesses in the lung, we didn't need anything else but to treat this girl. Another patient, 34 years old, 67 kilos, with a CCTGA allograft between the left ventricle and pulmonary artery, melody implantation 2009. In 2015, so after six years, he had fever, CRP. There was a hemophilus spacious in the blood culture. The pressure gradient between the left ventricle and pulmonary artery had risen, had risen to four meters per second. So he was put on antibiotics and we didn't really see the conduit. So we did an ICE procedure and you see an underlighting thrombus here and you also see one here. And during the course, when we gave antibiotics, the uh, gradient came down between the left ventricle and the pulmonary artery, and so we cured the patient with uh, antibiotic treatment, and he's now with a gradient of 2.9 and in NUHA1, and the, uh, it didn't come back, the infection. So this paper has been shown now uh, three times before, so I will not really talk a lot about this paper, but they said that bovine jugular vein uh, grafts, doesn't matter if melody or contagra, uh, how it's implanted, have a higher incidence of endocarditis. But at least I can say for our clinic that now we look at our melody patients really, really meticulously. We know from every patient if he has endocarditis or not. And if you look at this point, cases of suspected endocarditis, there's 21 in the melody group, but there's zero in the 3,888 homografts. So although I still believe that homograft is the best valve for the right ventricular outflow tract, I can't believe that there's zero of medical patients because we have every year five or six patients with homografts that are treated medically for endocarditis. So me melody data, at least in our center, are prospectively acquired, whereas the data from homograft and bioprosthesis valves are collected retrospectively. And I don't really think you can compare that. This is also, if you look at this, this is data from the STS database. And I just mean it's from 2015. Patients who came for pulmonary valve replacement Big numbers, 6,430 patients at the age of 17 years. And just as baseline, if they were asked if they had had an episode of endocarditis, it was very low because these patients have usually a native outflow tract. But then again, if they were operated at the age of 41, again, more than 3,000 patients, 12% of them had had an endocarditis. And this is just as baseline. It's not after the operation, it's just before. So you have to really scrutinize and make a good anamnesis to be sure about this endocarditis topic. There is some, uh, like I said before, there's some groups, and this is again the Necker group who said that there may be bovine jugular vein uh, grafts may have uh, more adhesion uh, of uh, endocarditis, and they 
did a study on four, uh, four melody valves, and they found out that selective adhesion of Staph aureus and Staph Streptococcus sanguis pathogenic strains to the melody valve tissue was noted on healthy tissue and increased after implantation procedural steps. So they said if you use a balloon on this valve, you make micro lacerations that make the uh, germs attach more easy. And that's also one thing uh, well, we talked before that the surgeons change their strategy very easy. Well, we also do the same. We changed our strategy that we don't postulate, that we've tried to make the valve landing zone big so we don't have to postulate, so we don't make these micro lacerations. So, Peter, we also change our policy sometimes. On the other hand, the, the study here from the Leuven Group showed, recently published in the journal Thoracic Cardiovascular Surgery, that our data provide evidence that the surface composition of the bovine jugular vein and the homograph tissue themselves, bacterial surface proteins and shear forces per se, are not the prime determinants of bacterial adherence. So there's still scientific possibilities to do some work. And this paper has also be, uh, been cited uh, by Nick Haas before, and I am not going into that, but I'm more or less just saying that the follow-up time for the melody in this cohort was five years, and for the sapien it was one year, and I think it's hard to say from this data, uh, it may be like that, but you don't really have robust data to say that. And uh, if you even look at the Sapien Compassion trial, there was four cases of endocarditis, and I think three cases of endocarditis, and I think the group was 69. So that adds up to 4% in a relatively short follow-up. So as a teenager, I, I, I was in the US, and uh, I really liked soft drinks at that time. And if you were in America, you had to decide if you drink Coca-Cola or if you drink Pepsi. You can't drink both. You have to decide for one drink, and you stick to that. Now I'm getting old, and I must think about my weight, so I don't drink pops anymore. But I'm an interventional cardiologist, and I'm very happy that, uh, that we have both valves, and we use both valves, and we are very happy because both valves have significant advantages. But I think uh, I wouldn't say I only take that one or that one. So in conclusion, all patients with bioprosthetic valves are at risk for infective endocarditis. In our patient cohort, the cumulative IE rate was 6%, and annual incidence was 1.9% per patient year. So far, all of our patients treated with infective endocarditis after PPVI survived, and I touch wood because some of them are really sick. During PPVI, we aim to achieve the best possible hemodynamic result, residual gradient less than 15, meticulous preparation of the landing zone, we try to avoid post dilation with high pressure balloons, but if we have a higher gradient, we would do it. In suspective IE after PPVI, key is clinical risk assessment and visualization of the implanted valve to decide on the adequate management strategy. Robust comparative data for surgical RVOT prosthesis is not available, so the relative risk of PPVI and less even if melody or sapien is better, is difficult to estimate. Prophylaxis to aid in prevention of IE are key after all bioprosthetic valve implants, surgically and catheter delivered. Anticoagulation may lower the incidence of primary thrombus formation, so there's still an open question whether we should go on with ASS or not. PPVI continues to provide a safe and beneficial therapeutic option for CHD patients who fa with failed RVOT conduits, delaying their next surgical step. And so with this, I would like to end again, and I think this is a story of success. We should always think that we achieve the same result with a percutaneous uh, route as with surgery. Thank you very much. <laughs>